I'm curious about um, just I'm just trying to imagine how you step out the airplane and it was it the summer winter in the, of, in the school yeah what, what did you feel I know you were with Sheila right so yeah. you had some support there but what, what, did you become a homesick how did it came in the beginning was it any cultural shock for you from what you expected oh my goodness all right I mean but a lot of that is you know this is um uh, I mean, this, this is sort of like just sort of personal impressions. Uh, and, and the fact of the matter is that my personal experience of Russia, it's just interpersonally with people, and my professional experience, while they weren't the same, they, overla they overlapped a good deal, right? Uh, so uh, there were people who uh, were part of Luria's laboratory that we became friendly with, and so we saw them more often. Uh, there were other, there were students at the university that we became involved with and so on. So, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I would, so I would set the stage as follows. Previously, I had spoken about the fact that when we went to Indiana University in 1959, it was with no idea whatsoever of going to the Soviet Union. I had no I there was nothing like that on my mind at all. It's just that Indiana had become the center of the exchange program. Mm -hmm. yeah this Russian Area Studies uh, program, which was a big graduate post-Sputnik kind of, um, you know, uh, push to get people trained to interact with the Soviets. And that played into my needs in terms of getting a second language, uh, doing mm -hmm. French, and um, um, giving me a minor, which I had to have because of the peculiar rules. So there's just like, at that level, the whole thing is just an accident. And not a, not so, but when I get off of the, so we go through the, the, all of this, and I made contact with Larry, and Larry said, "Sure, if you get chosen, I'd be glad to have you work in my laboratory." And I'm writing to him about semantic reflexes and his work with Vinogradova, and he, of course, is no longer. I now know, of course, uh, that and I discovered quickly that he was no longer really was interested in that topic at all. Mm -hmm. um, it would, that, that was rather a Pavlovian language through which he could study certain types of psychological processes that he'd been interested in studying the whole time. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, um, that's the, the sort of second signal system and uh, its relation to linguistic mediation are, you know, they're, they're very, you can, you, can, you can go back and forth on that, which is what people did during the, the period, the Stalin, the Stalin period. So, uh, so we've been through a program where uh, I've read a fair amount about uh, the Soviet Union and its history, the history of Russia, uh, contemporary politics about it, and then on my own I'm reading psychology to the extent that anything, anything is known about that get chosen for the exchange. Uh, my wife is with me. We've been married for three or four years at this point. She goes in the, in the, in, on her passport in the capacity of a wife. Uh, we get off, so, we're, so she's just accompanying me, and we, don't, we have a room. It means that we get two, two rooms, a little suite at Moscow University. So two small rooms with a toilet and a shower. That's a kind of minimal unit. Uh, for a lucky couple like ourselves, there, there, were, there were big families living in those rooms. But for us, it was it was uh, that was why we had the kind of we were and we were together, and that was I think important. Um, cool. And when we we get off the airplane in Chermetia Airport, was at that point very small. It's like a hangar plus a, a couple of offices or something. Is how I remember it. Very small uh, building. Uh, and we're met by Oleg Tikhomirov, and he takes us down to Moscow University and uh, up to our dormitory room, and we sort of quickly figure out where there are other Americans, because we know a group of us has studied together in the summertime, and so we know each other, the people who mm -hmm. are, okay. are there. And uh, it's uh, Saturday, so on Saturday night, we, get, we go all the way to the metro, and we go down to the Moskva Hotel, and we go to the top floor, and we go to the restaurant, we try to get a meal, and that was kind of our introduction to 
oh, intro wow. introduction to Russia. Uh, uh, and of course, you don't get a meal for a very long time, and then there's probably they're out of whatever. And uh, <laughs> there's very, very typical Ochi uh, Chorini <laughs> being sung by the people, the, the uh, black eyes being sung by the, yeah. um, the, the singers. Um, and it, then going the following day and meeting Luria, saying that in Russian I can speak a little Russian, and then he just speaks Russian to me. He, she understood, and we'd gone through language school together, so she was, her Russian was about as good as mine, a little bit different vocabulary. Um, and then on, on the following day, on Monday morning, I went, I went down to the laboratory um, and, at Porvienko and found my way there, and uh, Bernstein was giving a talk at the lab, and then Larry asked me to give a talk at the lab after with Bernstein there, in my absolutely horrendously bad Russian. Um, so, so then followed a, really a period of, uh, yeah, of course there's terrible culture shock. I mean, it, 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 Sheila put it very interestingly when she said, "Well, you know, she always imagined Russia as being all gray." <laughs> Right. Interesting, yeah. Right, right. all great. And there is, there's, there is something to that. Um, the situation we walked into was very bad. Um, it was uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis occurred six mm -hmm. weeks after we got there. There was a, uh, a big spy trial. And of all bad luck things, a colleague of mine who worked in Luria's laboratory was a distant cousin of the guy who was a spy. So it didn't make yeah. sense. So it's like. <laughs> I didn't know that for a long time. Uh, so you're in this situation where, as people said, if you're not paranoid, you don't understand what's going on. Well. Right. You, it, 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 you're in a paranoid situation. It is literally a paranoid situation. American asked me what it's like, and I say, um, I, the, the, East, that Ger the uh, movie about East Germany, The Lives of Others, is the closest I can come to explaining the extent to which you don't know who you're talking to and who they're talking to and so on. Uh, and so, uh, but in the course of that, in the lab, people were very friendly. Luria created this kind of magic space. And inside that space, hey, this is an American visitor. We have an official program. And they, they were perfectly nice to me. And I learned a lot, a lot of my Russian having to coordinate doing research with people with temporal lobe lesions where we did semantic conditioning. I did it with all styles, and, uh, uh, and then we got to meet no people at the university. And of course, some of them were not real, really friends. They were just people who were put in our path so that that uh, we could be kept track of. And others, others were real, actually real friends. And some were a little bit of both, where you couldn't actually, since any Russian who spends any time with an American would be questioned about what happened when they spent the time with the American. It's almost impossible to make that distinction, right? Mm -hmm. Every yeah, person talks, yeah. but there are there are differences in how the people then respond by how they spend their time with the Americans. So, um, and I think that was what sort of motivates the very the, those handful of people with whom we became close friends were really truly valued friends because you knew the uh, the degree of trust that you had to invest in that, even if in some cases it's an illusion. Uh, it's an illusion that's supported by the kind of cultural surround that you're in. So I don't know. I worked a lot. Uh, it was it, the situation was so fraught uh, um, that it was extremely difficult on my wife because she wasn't allowed to work, mm -hmm. yeah, and um, it, it got bad enough so that it threatened our stay in Russia. And I had to go to Luria in December and say. Uh, Alexander Manov, you're going to have to do something, or Sheila's going to leave, and if she leaves, I'm going to have to leave. So he he took it almost no time at all. I mean, she was the thing that she was interested in doing was journalism. Mm -hmm. So, like the next day, she gets a call from uh, uh, very uh, Zaslavsky, uh, not Zaslavsky. Yeah, there was a dean of the journal. Right, Zaslavsky. Yeah, the journal's right, right. And uh, she, so for the spring semester, she was enrolled in the journalism school. And mm -hmm. she, worked, she worked on Moscow News, which is the English language newspaper. newspaper yeah. And so that, that allowed her to participate a little bit in the work life of people, which was very important. Otherwise, 
she was caught in this very uh, odd uh, situation with a lot of wives who were not very happy with what with their situations, who spent too much time in the embassy, drank too much, and you know, just not 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 happy. Um, and so I, all of that made for, and then we we had uh, you know a few people who were close friends or intellectuals, so that. Uh, and we had some Amer some of the Americans on the exchange were incredible people, just amazing people. Um, and so we learned a lot. Uh, we went and we, Luria had a whole cultural program for us, so of course we did the cultural program. Uh, but that was a pleasure. And so I don't know that it would just it was um, leaving was uh, it was tired it was very tiring. It was totally exhausting. Uh, so leaving was uh, both. Like we were really glad to get the hell out of there, and on the other hand, it was very painful having to leave. And circumstances of all circumstances of communication then became really a problem, mm -hmm. really a problem. Um, and the sort of the way we things got kept up is that I was made the editor of the journal, the translation journal. And so that sort of, get, then I kept up my correspondence with Luria around publishing projects, which were approved of, officially approved of. Mm -hmm. uh, and then my own work got connected up with his work. And then that all allowed me to keep track of my friends over time. Uh, and some of that became very important quite a bit later uh, when we got involved with telecommunications in the Russians. Mm -hmm. As my the, the reason that, that I was positioned to be chosen by the American side to represent them, both from the National Academy of Sciences for Psychology and then Carnegie around computers and kids and that, and that kind of stuff, is that uh, I had connections with people who are now, you know, heads of laboratories or institutes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd known them for a long time. And... So I could enter into discussions with them about becoming involved in ways that nobody, literally there is nobody else uh, trained to do that. I was like, it was, who the hell did they have to turn to? So that you know, kept up the friendships uh, pretty much, uh, not every, some have fallen away. I think that um, uh, the time that uh, passes and your lives di diverge a lot, some people have died. Um, and other people, I think that the, the pain of the interaction gets to a certain point and they just say, flat it <laughs> and stop, you know, that's yeah. enough. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's very, it's very complicated. Um, one of the people that, I mean, again, those connections is that because of my father's connect, connections and hit the left wing part of my family, I met, uh, that was how I met Vladimir Posner. Mm -hmm. I met him through meeting his father. My father was, and, and my wife and I were invited to the Posner's. And so the father, Fologna's father and mother were there and his, his wife at the time. And that was in the spring of 63. Mm -hmm. He was, you know, he grew up in New York a lot. So it's like, we, it was very easy to become friends with him. And then as I went back, we, we were close friends. and and communicated primarily with people carrying letters for us. He was not, he would not expose himself to uh, corning correspondence. Um, but then it became, when, when the possibility of doing a space bridge came up simply because we were at Bologna's apartment, and I mean, if we hadn't been there, and if Sheila had, when I went back in 83, I took a delegation back. Mm -hmm. I only went back on condition that they find some, something interesting journalistically for Sheila to do. Mm -hmm. That was how the whole Space Bridge stuff started. Oh, wow. Interesting. You were in unique position, yes. Yeah, I mean, it was really, and that was a great thing that the United States did, is that they trained people who could actually get to know people who were going to be leaders in that country, so that you know, have some sort of intelligence in figuring out who the hell are you dealing with them, what, what can you expect, and how to inter you know and it's not that they're not in difficult positions with respect to the pressures on them and so on uh but it was great that that they let me even go it was a big deal i think it was a mm -hmm. volumes about the virtues of of the american policy that they would trust me to go and i think the united states is 
profited a lot, you know, uh, from the fact that they sent me. Uh, so it's like, didn't cost them a hell of a lot, you know, <laughs> and they, they got a lot in return. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it, it, of course, that makes the current situation just insane for me. Totally crazy. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to ask, yeah, I, I totally agree with you because this unique position when you have a real life trust, right? You're not a stranger neither to solve you've, done, you, you've engaged in joint projects with these people. You, yeah. know when they, you know when they keep their word and when they're baltoons and when they're whatever. And yeah. Because otherwise any project probably would deem to be dead in the, the, the beginning, right? Yeah, it has to be dead. It, it's only, you can only get the, go through the most formal pieces of it and then completely stylize social occasions. Yeah. Not real. And where you know the KGB is sitting at the table, you know, and so it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know for a fact. Um, if they're not, they're not doing their job. I mean, they're supposed to be there. So... But interesting for me is, uh, because you mentioned that Luria managed to create this lab. Yeah. Friendly, safe place and, and collegial, almost like a bubble within the... Yeah, yeah, it was, it was a bubble. So uh, it, it was interesting just in general. Do you think, I, I always had this feeling that Moscow University was slightly autonomous. Uh, for, is it, oh, it was in time, there was no, for, you know, until 66, there was no uh, Academy of Sciences Psychology Institute. Yeah. And everything was at MGU because it was MGU and Davidov's Institute, and they were right next to each other. Yeah. Right? They, they had a little bit more kind of freedom to be creative, right? For a little while, yeah. Little yeah, while. I mean, you know, I don't understand who they were suppressing. I mean... The, the, the argument between Ruchlinsky and uh, the Ruben, people who used Rubinstein mm -hmm. and those who went sort of with Leontiev. With Luria with, Le, Luria with Leontiev because he's with Nagotsky, yeah. Luria, Luria sent me to, to, for sure, to meet Rubinstein and to, to listen to what he had to say. And Luria never took sides in that kind of stuff. It was just, mm -hmm. um, he was, yeah, um, Right. It, I mean, at, at that time, then, it was, yes, there was autonomy. And you, they felt, you knew, you knew that Zaporozhets was a friend. You lived, they lived through Ukraine together, right? Yeah. And, and there was Zinchenko, who was in between generations. Mm -hmm. I got to know Zinchenko really not when I was a student there, but when I took a delegation with Don Norman. Mm -hmm. And, and he was sort of ergon in the ergonomics era. And then Volodya and I became really close friends. I mean, it was like, I, that was, uh, I learned a lot from him. He, he, I did not understand him after 1991 very well. I mean, he just went crazy with it, you know, with Mamaradishvili and po poetry and whatever. I mean, and spat and... Spat, right. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, but that was his own exploration of a lot of these issues in his own way. Um, so, yeah, that's why that was, that was a very important. The, the relationship with Luria was very important and with his kids. They were very sad, very sad people. Uh, really sad because you know his daughter was mentally ill his son they're both really good biologists mm -hmm. and they would had to come out of the whole Lysenko period so Soviet biology they were just they were decades behind and working under very you know uh, difficult conditions by American standards mm -hmm. that's hard for Americans to understand how badly equipped the Russian laboratories were people did things I, would, I would, was doing single cell recordings with uh, Vinogradova and rabbit brains, orienting reflex kinds of stuff. And I had to bring, uh, at one point I got, I got shipped in a particular type of shellac that you use for, um, you had to coat the needle down to the point in order to insulate it. We had to make our needles, and, and you only had time to do it like between 12 at night and 3 in the morning. <laughs> so I would walk over to the, it was in the Institute of Higher Nervous Activity at MGO, near, up on Menesky Gore, whatever mm -hmm. it's called. And um, I had to walk over there. And it, that's a hell of a walk, at, you know, when it's 20, minus 20 in the middle of the yeah. night. Yeah, you <laughs> like that. But, it, but 
but you had you, you couldn't go, you couldn't send to a company to send you the equipment. You had to make the stuff. A lot of the eye movement stuff that Luria and Yarbus did, those were ama they were amazing engineers who made that stuff work. Mm -hmm. They they were working with really crappy materials. Yeah. So I, you know, you, you're right. It always strikes me it's hard to explain to Americans the simple things like we didn't have enough paper to type on, right? Yeah, yeah. That could become a huge problem just to even type your article, right? Yeah, yeah, I, absolutely right. Yes. I mean, a lack of, and I think it was very interesting. I read uh, Yevgeny Velikov's autobiography. It's in English, yes. Mm -hmm. And he has nothing to say about our, my connections or any of that project. He doesn't touch on that at all, which is inter itself is interesting. Um, but uh, one of the things that comes through over and over again is Soviet atomic scientists are in competition with American comp atomic scientists. Mm -hmm. they, they, he was so proud of the Soviet work, the quality of the math, certain thinkers, certain people, and that they would do this stuff and they didn't have any of the equipment the Americans did. So the Americans liked the work the Russians did and thought it was really great, but they had no idea that they were doing it essentially with their bare hands. Mm -hmm. It was just like, and he has these crazy ways, and he figured out how to put the camp on Chernobyl, mm -hmm. right? I mean, he had that kind of a mind where he loves to come up with what we would call jury rigged solutions to problems. Mm -hmm. he, he, it makes him proud to do it with bad equipment. Yeah, but but it's but back to Luria. It's it's like Luria did. He pretty much before MRI. Oh yeah, through I mean, how the brain operates, isn't it? Magical? I mean, well, but but he was very interdisciplinary. So he he really he really had, had a close relationship with Anokin. Mm -hmm. So the whole functional system stuff is Anokin. Mm -hmm. And then I forget the name of the guy who had like. 50 EEG leads, you wear a cap, it was very early, there was a Russian guy. He had, to, so there other people doing the EEG work. Mm -hmm. And, and Yarbus, the eye movement work, um, I don't, I, I came after that. Mm -hmm. And Zinchenko also engaged in that. And now, of course, I think that work is fundamentally important, but it was, it was interesting. Mm -hmm. But Luria used it as a diagnostic technique for like for frontal lobe, that if you show a picture uh, of one of these 19th century Russian pictures, the, the, the missing son comes home. Mm -hmm. The jacket and the women are just looking at him and whatever. And you, you, have, you have somebody with brain damage look at that. They miss a lot of the important pieces of it. They, whereas you can compare a normal and non-normal eye scan. Mm -hmm. and the the, the non-normal one is too global. It's missing parts of the meaning of the thing. Yeah, that's interesting. That interesting. Yeah, but because because of lack of like advanced technology or something, right? They become somewhat, uh, you know, round the bound way, they were pushed to be extremely creative and oh, yeah. to, to fill the gaps which usually technology steps in. And to right. Fill. And of course, of course, for them, this kind of passion was an escape for what was going on around them in the world. If, for people like Larry, it was the only the only uh, channel to international contact, mm -hmm. and that was that was his, that was his his special, in a way, his special characteristic was his ability to uh, to charm and interest Westerners, and engage them about their work in a serious way, mm -hmm. to keep up the norm that this is that there's an international norm here. If you look at the first journal he was involved with, the Journal of Genetic Psychology, mm -hmm. they had they had their abstracts were in German, English, German, and Russian. So he was trying to be uh, like internationalized from the right. He, he was cosmopolitan in the very best sense of the word. Yeah, but would you say I I, I remember you mentioned in, in your writing that Luria kept telling you that Vygotsky is a genius, but would you say Luria was a genius? Well, I don't even know that Vygotsky, I don't know what a genius is. But, but he, he, uh, Luria, um, he was just an, ex he was a very exceptional human being. I actually think that the, the, his use of the combined motor method yeah. in the various earliest work is perhaps the, his major contribution. 
totally unrecognized how general that principle is. Yeah. Uh, and it was reduced to calling it a lie detector and all of that. But the, the underlying principle is, is really fundamentally important. And then he really could generalize the theory. He could take all of these different potentials in the cultural historical theory. And I'm not that doing, he wasn't complicated in the same way that, like in his autobiography, uh, he has its instrumental, it's, it's cultural, it's historic, something. But he doesn't give it a name. He just says it, called these different things. His genius was, I th always thought, it didn't matter where you put him, he, he would do science. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter. You know, it, it's like, all right, so retarded kids. Oh, well, I could do retarded kids. Oh, people would say, oh, yeah, we could do, oh, okay. schizophrenics, why not? Okay. So he was like universalist, right? Like yeah, he's a, he, he, he understood the principles in a way and he wasn't an activity theorist in the way that others are. I don't think I never talked to him about activity. Mm. But he was he was very, really really good at thinking about how the basic sort of triangular thing, right? Control yourself on the outside. Mm -hmm. Method of dual stimulation. I mean, he he just thought that way. Mm -hmm. And it, it's very Bartinian to me because it's it's power comes from indirection. Power comes through. Um, Ventral equation, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the same. It, it's a totally Bakhtinian idea. It's just that Bakhtin was talking about people, and Luria was talking about other kinds of objects. But they had they understood each other perfectly, and I'm convinced that Luria knew or felt that the only way Vygotsky would be remembered is if he could get the Americans to say that Vygotsky was smart. And if the Americans said that Vygotsky was smart, the Russians were sure to find Vygotsky smart. And that would secure his place in history. Oh, I see. That's why I keep he kept telling you that Vygotsky was genius. He well, wanted... that's, why, that's why he kept giving me tasks. That's why I was caught up in, and he had Arthur Rosenthal on this side who wanted to publish these books. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was, I was this middleman in this, in there trying, and I couldn't only deliver on small pieces of that. Mm -hmm. I had a whole other career. I did not, I was not doing this. This has always been like this has always been like uh, almost like a hobby. It's, it's something that's slightly on the side. There are people who do it professionally, you know. Yeah, but but because you were in this unique position of trust, right? You probably felt the respons huge responsibility to continue, right? Oh, of course. I mean, I felt, to Luria, I could. I, I felt a very strong responsibility to Luria. I, I mean, he he made he went way out of his way. To mm -hmm. You know, for us, and I really learned a lot. I learned an awful lot, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I really sympathize with the guy a lot because he was he was scared. He was a very frightened man. So Kolya Goldberg, when he writes about that, it's not it's not untrue. So it's so amazing that he could be this 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 uh, safety creating bubble creating person, right? Who got things actually got things done, unlike a lot of the people around, and at the same time, be really very frightened. Mm -hmm. And I never, I never, I mean, from him, I didn't get this. It was always his daughter or his wife or somebody who would talk about the, mm -hmm. the, the domestic realities, you know. That, that yeah, but but did, didn't you write that he said, Vremina Slozne Durakov Noga? Oh, yeah. yeah. That was his sort yeah. of favorite saying, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No wonder he was frightened because. Durakov Noga Bill. Oh yeah, but I mean, his father was a Kremlin doctor. I mean, I mean come on, <laughs> here's this Jew living across the street from the Kremlin, and it's like, no, wait a second. So I mean, it, it was scary. It must have been just utterly terrifying, utterly terrifying. Did Did you personally or Shayla felt insecure or frightened at any point? Was no, no, no. Par uh, partly, partly because. I didn't think because of my own radical background in my family, I didn't think they would touch me. I, I didn't think the Russians would touch me. Uh, and, we, and we never caused it, and we didn't cause any, we were, we were very law-abiding. We didn't take a lot of photographs because it was a pain to take photographs. You know? mm -hmm. uh, it's just alienating to take, go around taking photographs. Um, and there, you're just under suspicion all the time. Yeah. So in that way, we were very law-abiding citizens. Um, and it had no 
no illusion that that and they, were, they were quite restrictive laws. But you that, had that academic some of the people. Agenda, right? You only had the academic agenda, and then they let you in. So that probably was another level. Well, but there, there were other there there were others on our there were there were James Bond style you know blackmail things went on with. So it was like it's not that real Cold War stuff didn't happen. It's not that nobody was drugged. Not that nobody went beyond. 40 kilometers from from the Kremlin, and then got grabbed by the KGB, and then given a hard given a hard time. Of course. Yeah, I forget about this. It was actually a restriction for you guys to not to go out. Oh yeah, we couldn't go anywhere. Oh wow, yeah, no, I no. yeah, I remember that now. Yeah. We were we actually we were supposed to fly from Tbilisi to to Kiev. The plane was for some reason canceled. And so we, we, Kiev, something was wrong in Kiev, so we had to go back to Moscow. They scheduled us to get us to Moscow. We had to fly from <laughs> Tbilisi to Krasnodar, and then get a big airplane in Krasnodar. Mm -hmm. And the small airplane was really small. It was like ten passengers. So it's a little tiny propeller airplane, and it flew at about seven thousand feet. So you could see the deer running in the forest, and it was just great. We got to Krasnodar, and they foreigners at Krasnodar. So they put us in a dining room that's way off all by itself. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we had to sit there and wait while they flew us back properly to Moscow. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, one tend to forget these details, but yeah, I remember the, all the restrictions for the foreigners. They were quite draconian, I think. Right. And, and it, it, any, any Russian who got too friendly with them was also going to encounter what they may not have experienced before. They may not have had, had direct experience with the state system. Mm -hmm. you know, it may have just been a rumor for them before, but it wasn't a rumor when you get a visit from a KGB guy in the dorm room.